with those instruments as a child, so I know a lot about them. It's very difficult to play a mandolin classically, play a classical style. You play a mandolin like you do a violin, but you play a guitar entirely different, so there's two different instruments there. And that was a real blessing to me. Well, I could, I could sit there and listen to that all night, I'll tell you. I really appreciate that so very much. And uh, I, uh, the mandolin, I mean the harmonica really is my instrument. And I like to play it, but I like to hear all the instruments. And uh, I appreciate the song service tonight. Amen? You know, you people are spoiled. You know that? With all the classical... Uh, classy music around here. You, you just can't hear that everywhere. And so uh, it's a real blessing, you know. Did you know that God likes music? And uh, the Bible's full of music, all kinds of music. And the Bible says, let all the instruments praise the Lord. And that's what we should do, amen? Praise the Lord with everything we have and uh, honor Him. All right, I want you to turn your Bibles tonight to John chapter 14. While you're turning there, I would like to say that I sure have enjoyed being here with you these 10 days. Uh, You know, I'm like Simon Peter. I just think we all just build the tabernacles and stay. Amen. I I would love to do that. Uh, But uh, God's got all kind of places lined out for me to go to. And I hope that you'll pray for Lois and I. It's getting more difficult out there on the highway to uh, drive and travel. You know, uh, there's more cars out there than ever. You know, I, it's un- unbelievable how thick the traffic is. And my uh, my timing is not as good as it used to be. And uh, so it, it's it's a miracle every time Lois and I take off and come back home. <laughs> so we, we need your prayers about that. Amen. So please pray for us. Pray. Don't just say, dear God, bless the Claytons. I've said this here before, but let me say it again. Don't just say, dear God, bless the Claytons, because there are some Claytons that shouldn't be blessed. <laughs> and uh, so you, you remember us in your prayers in a special way. I want to thank everybody that has uh, prayed for our, our getting Bibles to Pakistan. I was on the phone this afternoon extensively arranging all of that. We've got to get our paper from South Korea. And uh, the binding has to take place there. It's, you know, it's a big, it's a big thing. But, you know, the Bible's the Word of God. And if you can get the Bible in the hands of people. I don't say very much about, I don't mention anybody's names or any places. But I can say this, I can say this. We're going to take a lot of those Bibles to Karachi, Pakistan. I first got interested in Karachi, Pakistan back in 1952. No, 50, 59 is when I got interested in Karachi, Pakistan. It's a big city. It has a history like you can't believe. If you want to read something exciting about a history, read the Read the uh, history of Karachi, Pakistan. It's unbelievable. And so we hope that you'll be praying for us in that particular way. I believe in your prayers. I really do. And God's working this all out for us. He really is. And uh, like uh, so oftentimes he does in our ministry, he gives us all that we need. And sometimes that's a very expensive proposition. And uh, so uh, God... uh, God's able to do all of that. And I, I don't tell people how much money I raise. I don't, I don't do that. I don't go around telling that. But God, God's always supplied abundantly our needs in the ministry and especially getting the Bible out throughout the world. And so, uh, you know, uh, just, uh, it's just amazing. It, you know, I'm just a poor farm boy, you know what I mean? I told the people today at lunch... Uh, oh, that was a good lunch too, wasn't it, huh? Wow, how many of you were at lunch today? All of you old folks, well, raise your hand. Come on, put it up. Oh, you're too full to raise it. I tell that. Well, for supper tonight, I had a half a bologna sandwich. How many of you eat bologna? Come on, I'll confess it. Yeah, okay. 
That baloney is good stuff. I, Jared bought it for me, so blame it on Jared. All you health food people. No, I told him to get us some baloney. <laughs> when we were kids, baloney was a real treat, you know. So uh, I ate a, that's all I had was a half a baloney sandwich. For some, don't you feel sorry for me? But I had such a big lunch, that's all I needed. And we had a good time there at lunchtime with the senior citizens. And, uh, you know, Lois and I, I guess, are senior citizens now. And uh, we get all kind of discounts, senior citizen discount. They don't ask me to any identification. They just look at me in my face as identification enough. But uh, uh, we thank you so much. Oh, I enjoyed being in the college. I could talk a long time on that. It's a fun thing to be in the college this week. Those students are good people. You know that? And you're really making a contribution here to world evangelism through those students. And we thank God for that. Thank God for our masters. And uh, I've uh, really been involved in a lot of colleges over the years. And uh, God has permitted me to help a bunch of colleges over the years. All over the world, actually. And uh, I am thankful for the Bible colleges that we've been able to teach young men and women uh, about the Lord. That's so important. I'm really not a great teacher. I'm just a preacher. God called people to do a lot of things, but God called me to preach. And that's what I like to do, and that's what I do. So I was able to preach three hours a day this week and then other occasions. And I've enjoyed it every bit. I could preach. Uh, you know, somebody said, you know, Brother Clayton can preach at the drop of the hat, and he'll drop the hat. Amen. All right. John chapter 14. Just a couple verses here in the beginning of the John chapter 14. Jesus said, Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word tonight. I'd like to preach to you something about the idea of saying goodbye. Jesus saying goodbye to his disciples. You know, uh, you've changed the tune of the, took the volume. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Okay, all right. Just so you can hear me, that's all that matters. It was a mess at that time in Jerusalem. There was trouble in the streets. Big trouble in the streets. You know, there's, a, there's an atmosphere that goes along with uh, riotous situations in cities. I've been in several over the years. I've been in five war zones. And I preached in those places, you know, where nobody else would want to go. And so I can sense the spirit in the streets of Jerusalem. People were saying, especially the priests and other leaders of Judaism were saying, we've got him now. We've got him this time. We sent the army out to arrest him and they came back empty-handed. They could have lost their heads over that disobedient, uh, disobedience to high orders like those given them. They brought him in and said, why didn't you arrest him and bring him in here? Their only excuse was, no man ever spake like this man. The preaching made him forgot their duty. Can you imagine that? Jesus was a great preacher. We've got him now, they were saying. We've bought off one of his disciples for 30 pieces of silver. That's a real bargain. You couldn't buy a slave for that. It's a slave market. We've got him now. On occasion, he's passed out of our midst 
unseen, unnoticed. But we got him now. We're going to get him. We're going to kill him. And we're going to kill that Lazarus too, whom he raised from the dead. And we're going to get all those Galilean disciples of his. We're going to kill a whole bunch of them. That was what was in the street. I can remember being in a situation like that one time. And I'll tell you, it, it, it certainly wasn't fun. In fact, I've been in several, but I do. One comes to me in, in a riotous situation in Haiti. And we were looking around, and there wasn't anybody white there but us. A sea of black people, and they were riotous. And I was very, fear, I was very fearful, to tell you the truth, for our safety. There's a spirit about something like that. And it was prevailing in Jerusalem. In fact, at the crucifixion, all the disciples forsook him and fled. I don't know where they went. Maybe one of them was hiding behind the stump where they cut the tree down for the cross. Maybe one of them was hiding in the house of Simon the leper. Maybe one had found a quiet place even in the temple where Jesus had spoken to hide himself among the multitudes. But there was problems in the streets and problems with the disciples. Jesus had already told the disciples, I'm going to leave leave and go to Jerusalem. I'm going to leave Jordan and go to Jerusalem. And when I get up there, I'm going to die. I'm going to be... I'm going to be killed. I'm going to offer myself a sacrifice. And Thomas said, let's just go up to Jerusalem and die with him. Peter had bought a sword. And he said, I'm going to die with you. I'm going to fight with you. I'm going to stay with you. And Jesus said, oh, no, you're not. You're going to deny me three times. Before the morning comes and the cock will crow. You see, Jesus had come into this world through a barn door. And now he's going to leave it by a bloody cross. He'd come into this world with the hosts of heaven. Saying, Hosanna to the highest. Now he's going to leave it with the mobs in the streets crying, crucify him, crucify him. He'd come into this world being fondled by the fingers of a lovely little maiden virgin girl from Nazareth. Now he's going to leave it by being beaten to a pulp by the fists of angry Roman soldiers. He's going to be covered with his own blood and lacerated in the face until they could not even recognize him as a human. Hair all pulled out. Probably head twice the size from the beating he took. He's going to go to the cross. He'd come into this world as the virgin born son of God. Now he's going to leave the world As a sacrificial lamb offered on the altar of God for the sins of the whole world. And here he gathers his disciples to him. And he says to them, I'm going to go away. I'm going to leave you. It must have sounded like the drum of a funeral dirge pounding through the streets with the rhythm of a heartbeat when he said, I'm going to leave you. I'm going to go away. Well, I'm sure that Paul, I mean that Peter would say, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. If you leave, what, what have we got left? Wow. Where are we going to go? We're going to go back to Judaism, that lifeless, 
mass of laws that cannot even forgive us of our sins. Where are we going to go? Are we going back to the priests in the temple whose lives are worse than ours? Where are we going to go? Are we going to go back to Moses' law? Wow. You're going to leave us. I don't know if you've ever said goodbye to someone dear to you. Maybe you said goodbye to someone at the cemetery standing by a new dug grave over the dirt spread carpet and there was flowers on the coffin lid and the name of the dead person was not even carved on the tombstone and you stood there and you wept and said goodbye. I don't like to say goodbye. I hate to say goodbye. I've said goodbye all my life. I started out as just a boy, 16 years old, leaving home. And I said goodbye to my mom and daddy. And at 18, I left home as a boy again to go into the ministry of evangelism. And I said goodbye to my mama on the back steps of our little country home. And I kissed her cheeks covered with her own tears. I got in the car and started down that road and across the railroad tracks. I looked back and Mama was waving goodbye with a handkerchief soaked with her own tears. I don't like to say goodbye. I've said goodbye to my loved ones sometimes that I knew on this earth I'd never see again. I said goodbye to my wife on two occasions when I was gone for three months in evangelism and not able to call her, not able to write her, not even able to telegraph her, not one word. She didn't know whether I was alive or dead in the Amazon jungle. It's hard to say goodbye. I don't like to say goodbye. Goodness, I hate it. One time we had been on the road with our grandkids all of them were with us. All the grandkids were with us at this time. And we traveled all over the country. I think we all came here at one occasion. And we traveled all over the country and holding meetings, revival meetings, and children's programs, and all of that kind of thing, and thing of evangelism. And, and finally the boy said, Dad, you know, uh, we want to pastor a church. Uh, and uh, and they, they started saying, you know, I'm, we're, we're going to look for a church and, and pastor a church. I, I told them, I said, you, you can leave us if you want to, but leave the kid, grandkids with us. They wouldn't do that. After they had uh, got settled in churches, we went back to Steve's church in Salina. And the kids came running out when we pulled our rig up in the backyard of their farmhouse. And the baby of the family ran out and jumped in my arms. He just jumped and I grabbed him. He put his little hands on my face. I'll never forget it. He looked at me and said, Grandpa, no more goodbyes. He wanted my attention. That way Mama talked to him sometimes, you know. He said, yeah, Grandpa, no more goodbyes, Grandpa. No more goodbyes. I don't like to say goodbye, but Jesus was saying goodbye here. I have to tell you that I remember on the farm when I was a boy, my dad one morning spoke to us at the table. It was me and grandma and, and mom and dad at the table, and he said to us, grandma and I didn't know, mom knew, but he said, I'm going to have to leave the farm. There's not enough money here really for me to pay the bills, and I'm going to have to go to Zanesville and, and, and have a job, and, and I'll be gone for a while. And, and boy, it startled me that Dad was going to leave. Well, I wouldn't be right around there. Dad was the authority of that house and that family. And he said, Babe, you're going to have to be the man of the house now. And I was just a little boy. He said, I want you to take care of the barnyard and make sure... The eggs are gathered in the, in the chicken house and make sure that there's cobs in the box for mom's stove and coal for the heating stove and, 
You, you take care of the garden and you take care of everything in the house. And boy, I mean, I got an I a, a, a empty place in my stomach and, and I, I, felt, uh, I felt totally unapt and I, unable to do that kind of a thing. Dad was going to say goodbye. I remember that big old green truck coming down over the hill and across the river bridge. I could see it out of the big farm window in our kitchen. And it came up our old gravel road with billows of dust rolling behind the dual wheels of the big old Dodge truck with cattle racks on it. And it drove up and underneath our great big old cottonwood trees it turned up our rocky drive and came up to the back door and dad went out with a box that mom had prepared him and got in the truck. We kissed him goodbye and he started down that road, down the gravel road, across the creek bridge, across the river bridge, up over the hill and out of sight well, I, I felt at unease. I mean, I was in charge now. Dad was gone, and, and he had said goodbye. Man, I got everything ready. I got my little dog and tied him on the back porch. He would have tore that place up if anybody would have come around there. I got my little twenty-two rifle and put it by my bed and made me a little club to defend mom and grandma. Somebody would have come on there to hurt me. They had to kill a little country boy to get ever get to my mama, I'll tell you that. I was in charge. Jesus is saying to the disciples here, later on he says, greater works you're going to do than I've ever done. And I'm sure that they felt like, without you? Wow. We don't want you to leave. We don't want you to be gone. But Jesus is saying goodbye. Whew. But he says this when he says goodbye. He said, you know, I'm going to go away and prepare a place for you. I'm going to leave, but I'm going to prepare a place for you. You know, I'm going to give you a special a special place to spend eternity. Boy, that's going to be something, amen? When in six days he made everything we know, he made the Rocky Mountains covered with little mists and clouds like halos in the sun. He, he made the wide rivers. He made the oceans. He filled them full of all kinds of life. Hey, listen... Jesus did everything we know today in six days and he's been away 2,000 years preparing a place for us. How beautiful heaven must be. Sweet home of the happy and free. A haven of rest for the weary. How beautiful heaven must be, the old song says. He said, I'm going to leave you but I'm not going to leave you comfortless. I'm going to leave you with a promise. The promise is I'm going to go away and prepare a place for you. It's going to be a wonderful place. There's no policeman there because there's no crime. No little abused girls, no abused wives. No one's abused there because there's no criminals. Nobody's going to be sick there because there's no hospitals. Amen. Amen. It's a place of happiness and joy. It's a place where we'll never say goodbye. The old song says, We'll never say goodbye in heaven, in the glory over yonder. We'll never say goodbye in heaven. We'll never say goodbye up there. With all the insecurity and sorrow that went with the, along with the goodbye, there was joy in the hearts of everyone, even of us here tonight, by saying, one of these days, we're going to go to that place. Jesus is preparing a place for us. And there'll never, never be any goodbyes there ever again. He said, I'm going to go away. 
but I'm going to prepare you a place. I told, told a little dying lady in North Carolina, Charlotte, North Carolina Hospital one time. Won't be long until you go up there, but when you get up there, they're going to put you to work because they're building New Jerusalem up there now. I said, you'll probably go up there and work. She'd worked hard all of her life. Her little fingers were twisted and gnarled from the hard work she had done, taking care of her family without a husband. Now she's going to die and go to heaven, and there's all kind of activity there. And I told her, I said, when you get to heaven, I want you to find my mother. She'll be in the kitchen. That's where my mom will be, cooking cinnamon rolls. And I said, when you find her, she said, Brother Clayton, you think I will? I said, sure. You're going to be smarter up there than you are here. Find her and tell her that her baby boy still loves her. And one of these days, I'm coming to see her again. Wow. Jesus said, I'm going to leave you, but if I leave you, I'm going to come again. Well, that, that ought to be joy to all of our hearts here tonight. We're going to lay down our burdens down by the riverside. Wow. We're going, to, we're going to meet the Lord Jesus face to face and we're going to see all the grandeur of God in heaven. We're going to see God on the throne. Wow. We're going to hear the angel choir saying, Hosanna to the Lord in the highest. What a thing that is. We're going to, I mean, that's what I anticipate. That's what I long for more than any other thing I can think of tonight. I long for that day when the Lord comes and takes us away, gets us out of here, get us away from all the trouble and strife and all the junk that goes along in this world and away from politics. Won't that be something? No politicians in heaven, I don't think. <laughs> Maybe there will be some, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, little boy said, little girl said, Brother Clayton, how can you tell when a politician's lying? I said, I don't know, hon. How do you tell? She said, when his mouth's moving. I said, well, <laughs> that's not every one of them for sure, but maybe it's a majority, I don't know. But he said, I'm going to prepare you a place. Oh, won't it be wonderful to sit down in heaven with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. See Paul the Apostle. See the old-time preachers. It's going to be a joy for me to see all those old-time preachers that I knew as a young preacher boy preaching in their great churches. I'm going to be able to see them again. What a wonderful time that's going to be. And I'm going to see my loved ones I've got five brothers over there and four sisters. Boy, it's going to be a great time when we see them again. Wow. The Lord said, I'm going to go away, but I'm going to prepare you a place. And after I get it all prepared and all ready, I'm going to come again. I'm going to come back here to this earth again. Let not your heart be troubled. Ye believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. Boy, it's wonderful that Jesus is going to go. And he said, I'm going to come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am there ye may be also. Jesus is going to come, and he's going to gather us unto himself and take us away to that marvelous place. That's the hope in my heart that keeps me driving on and driving on and driving on. Knowing that one of these days he's going to come and take us away. He said, uh, I will come again and receive you unto myself. Oh, there was trouble in the streets in Jerusalem. The disciples were under threat. There was uh, problems all around Israel. And uh, just looming up before Jesus in hours 
after he had said this was that bloody cross. But this wonderful assurance lifts the spirits and drives us on. And all the things that the Lord wanted to do through the disciples had been laid out. And now when the Holy Spirit of God comes at Pentecost to dwell within the local church, it's going to be a wonderful event and a victory like nobody has ever seen before. Hallelujah to God. He said, I'm going to come again. Or I remember when I was a boy, Daddy had written Mom and said, I'll be home at such and such a time. Mama had got everything. I got everything ready for him to come. I, I went out and mowed the grass and picked all the weeds out of the garden, even the little tiny weeds like that around the corn. I got everything out of that garden as far as weeds are concerned. I cleaned up the barnyard. I had, I had everything. Mom had fixed up the house, and she had been cooking all morning, getting all the things ready that Daddy liked. And the house was as clean as a pin, and Mama had her spatial dress on. And I was sitting there by that window and I looked up and I saw that old green Dodge truck come down over that hill. I blinked my eyes because I've always had one bad eye and sometimes I don't see well. And I thought, well, maybe, am I imagining this? And no, sure enough, it was that Dodge truck. And it came down over that river bridge and then came up that old dusty road that we had and across the creek bridge and underneath the... uh, cottonwood trees and up our driveway by our back door and dad got out. Daddy was home. And it seemed like that everything just shifted in gear. It just wasn't balanced while dad was gone, but all of a sudden everything balanced out and daddy was home and all was right. I could sleep all night that night, the first time since dad was gone that I did. Boy, what fun it was when daddy came. One of these days, the Lord Jesus is going to come. Boy, it's going to be a great day. You know what he's going to do? He's going to come and get us all together, all of us born again people, and he's going to take us up, up to heaven, and we're going to be up there seven years And in that seven years, he's going to be passing out rewards. Well, you could talk about Christmas under the tree. That'll be a greater day than all of us have ever seen when the Lord passes out our rewards to us. And and, and we're going to be able to we're going to be able to enjoy heaven and the presence of the Lord there. For, for seven years. And after the seven years is over, together we're going to come back with him, back to this earth, and we're going to take this dude over. The politics are not going to run Washington. We are. But we'll do some straightening out, won't we? We'll go down to towns, and we'll go walking down Main Street, and we'll close every bar and every brothel, and we'll put a sign on the front door, closed for a thousand years. We'll set up his kingdom. And Jesus will march in Jerusalem and take over Zion's hill. And he'll set up his government there that will rule and reign for a thousand years. And we're going to have a part of that. And we're going to have us a brand new body. I'll take a nice thin one. Thank you very much. But looks at some of us here tonight, we could sure stand one, couldn't we? The Lord's going to come and take us out of here. I mean, after, after it's all over, when it's all done and said, we'll be with Jesus. And you know what? Whenever he comes and gets us, we're going to stay with him. Wherever he goes from then on, we're going with him. And it's going to be a wonderful event when we see his face. Oh, he doesn't have a crown of thorns now. It's a crown of gold. He he doesn't have a lacerated face. 
He has a face that will outshine the sun. He's not robed in his own blood. He's robed in a righteous robe of righteousness of himself. And we'll see all of that and be with him forever. All the goodbyes are not so bad when we know that the Lord's coming and he's going to take us away. Boy, how I look for that. How long I long for that. A lot of problems in this old life now. And sometimes I have to say, Lord, please stand by me in this difficult hour when the storms of life are raging, stand by me. When the storms of life are raging, stand by me. When I do my, the best I can and my friends misunderstand, thou who rulest wind and water, stand by me. What a wonderful thing it is to know that Jesus is with us tonight. And he's going to stand with us. And not only that, but one of these days, he's going to come and get us and take us to heaven. Are you ready for that? Let's bow our heads in prayer tonight.